dear uh, beloved community, it's such a joy to have an opportunity to be together with you this evening. I hope everybody's doing well, um, that you're all at ease and safe wherever you might be. Um, this evening is the 12th of July in the year 2020. Um, so we're sitting together and we have a chance to look this week into the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, which I'm really excited to share with you about this evening. Um, we're going to be looking at right intentionality, which as everybody um, in the Compassionate Ocean Sangha knows, I love to speak about. I can't stop speaking about right intentionality. Um, so in the Pali, again, last week when we were exploring um, right view, we discovered that right, um, the word that we, we translate as right originally in Pali is Sama, and it means complete or having a sense of being upright and not bent in any way. So when we consider intentionality, one thing that's on my mind and I, I wanted to share with you are three principles of this monastery, Mountain Spring Monastery, where I have a, I'm really lucky and I have a chance to, to live and practice at this moment in time. We came here quite unexpectedly. Um, land was offered and uh, lockdown in Australia began. And so in that environment, we began to uh, create a practice life here and to be able to offer a place of refuge for people to come and practice. And so being here in these simple conditions, we were walking around and we were sitting and we were breathing. And there were three principles of um, our practice that really um, felt important for us to hold at this time. And the first, um, well, before I even go into these principles, the principles themselves can look very basic or even superficial. Um, especially if we're looking from the outside or we only focus on the outside aspect of these principles. But I feel also that these three principles are in fact quite deep. Um, they're deep spiritual principles. And we can approach them in a simple way in the beginning by focusing on the outward conditions, or we can approach them in a deep way um, by looking at our inner situation. Um, and these three principles, I feel, are, um, are really helpful for us here in Mountain Spring, and they're also helpful for myself in my own practice life. And I think they might be helpful for you in your own practice life as well, and especially when we're considering a right or complete or whole or upright intentionality. I wanted to share these three principles that we've uh, we started to notice really shape our way of being here. The first is we use what we have. Um, when we came here, we didn't even have shovels to, <laughs> to shovel the garden. So we, look, we were looking around and saying, we don't have any tools, we don't have this, that, and the other. And so we, we sat together and we, we said, you know what, we'll have the principle of using what we have. Um, not looking at what we don't have, but what we actually have. And we'll make good use of that. So whatever condition we have, we enjoy it and we don't see it as a limitation. Um, we don't see that we're limited in somehow if we don't have a particular thing. Um, in fact, we're practicing to look and see the things we don't have, not as limitations, but as opportunities. Um, a simple example is if we don't have a meditation hall, which we don't have a large meditation hall at the moment, where I'm sitting right now is our meditation hall and it's our dining hall and it's our meeting room and it's a resting room and many of these things uh, all together. If we don't have a large meditation hall to um, welcome people in, rather than feeling that to be a limitation, we've actually begun to see it as an opportunity. Um, we take people when they come here for a day of mindfulness or to visit, we take them down to the forest and we sit and we walk and we have a mindful meal and so on down in the forest. Um, in fact, it's uh, those days of mindfulness have become uh, beautiful. They've become wonderful. Another opportunity that's opened up is that since we don't have a multi-purpose hall here on the monastery, 
about 300 meters down the road, there's a community hall. So we have um, our activities down at the community hall, which has helped us to be able to not only offer mindfulness activities for our sangha or the choir, the people who you would expect, but also to be able to reach out and to become part of this local community and to discover new ways to share the Dharma um, and the essence of the practice in a way that's appropriate for this situation. So in fact, rather than us sitting up here and, and thinking, oh, we need this and we need that and we need something else, um, we actually um, focus on the opportunities that this situation provides us. Um, it's so easy to get caught in the idea of limitation, whether it's outward conditions or whether it's with, within ourselves. We think that we're limited in some way or that we don't have enough or that we're not enough um, and focus on what we don't have to what we already have and offer from that and also um, the opportunities that when we're limited in some way, the opportunities that it provides. So we change our focus to what we do have and we see the things that we might have previously looked at as limitations, as opportunities, and on an inner level, that's the outer level, but on an inner level, it's an invitation to bring ourselves fully to our path, just as we are uh, right now, and to not try to be anything other than what we are. Um, to be simple, open, and authentic, and to bring forth wisdom, if there is any, to bring forth wisdom and insight from the heart of our own experience, um, not from somebody else, but from our own experience rooted in this place and in this time. So that's the first principle um, that we've kind of found here of Mountain Spring. We use what we have, both physical things and also the qualities and tendencies that we have we'll use those, uh, we'll use those to be of use to, to others. And the second um, came about um, from an experience that I've had a few times in my practice life, but um, most recently when I was in, I was practicing in Oregon um, for a couple of months and uh, I went up there and I was enjoying a solo retreat um, and I had very limited conditions, I had very limited um, things. And uh, so I, I remembered a teaching of the, of the Buddha that if we practice wholeheartedly, we practice with all of our heart, we practice sincerely, then um, we don't need to worry about anything, that there's a protective aspect of, of the practice. So the second principle is that we will not ask for anything. This is not passive aggressive, not asking for anything, but rather it's a practice of being joyfully open to receive um, and to not uh, worry about, about things. We've really found um, it to be the case that by simply being open, by simply being sincere, by um, uh, being open, that we really don't need to, to worry about anything. Um, if we've, uh, we, uh, Practitioners just will suddenly show up and they'll bring um, food or um, other things that we need. For a long time, we actually had nowhere to sit and eat. We would uh, sit and eat on the floor, which is not um, something unpleasant to us. It was just uh, what it was. We sat and we um, just sat on the floor. And I said to Brother Tenzin, it would be nice to have a little coffee table or maybe we could see if we could get a few bricks and put a few bricks so that we can put our bowl down a little bit higher than on the floor. And we just both said, yeah, that's a nice idea. And then we kept um, just going about our day. And a few days later, somebody showed up and they bought uh, a little coffee table. Um, one of the practitioners uh, unexpectedly showed up and they brought a coffee table. And so we cut the legs off and we uh, were able to have a small table to be able to eat at. Things like that, um, always just enough, um, never too much. And that's a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we practice not to demand anything in particular, um, but just to be open to receive, uh, to live very simply and to receive and to celebrate the gift that uh, we're offered. We don't always get what we want. We don't often get, get what we want um, in life, but um, 
we've noticed that the simple things, the things that we actually need, they always just appear at exactly the right moment. Um, we don't, we practice living simply, we practice to live lightly, um, and we're practicing not to wish for things to be different, um, but rather to bring our whole selves to our practice and uh, to really rely and belong to the Sangha in, in a way, um, a very concrete way. It's a very beautiful um, practice of changing the focus from what we think we need to what we're receiving in, in every moment. And then the third principle is what we have, we share. Um, when we have something or when we receive something from our friends, one day um, a practitioner showed up with 12 pineapples, <laughs> then we share. Um, we share it with the neighbors or we share it with other people who need it. Um, we've, there's a, a community group in the area called Mountain of Joy um, who are helping people in this area that um, have suffered quite deeply from fires, um, who are, are in a very difficult situation. Uh, we, we do our best to be able to contribute to these efforts in the, in the area. So whenever we have something, a material condition or an insight, if we're lucky enough to have an insight, then we share it to whatever capacity we're able to share it. We won't hold back on sharing material things um, with the idea that these things give us security. It's so easy, um, like in, in our situation, in the monastic world to think, oh goodness, we have only three apples uh, you know, this week. Um, we can't give uh, any apples or something, we're gonna need that. And we've noticed if we have that mentality, then um, we always seem to be lacking something. But if we share out what we have, we actually, it's really strange. It's so counterintuitive that we, we, all, we have an abundance um, that it, it just flows like that. And with physical conditions, but also um, with sharing any insight that we might have also, as little as we might think that they are, we'll do our best to, to share any insight that we have. Um, we won't hold back thinking that we're not ready or that we don't have enough um, insights yet or other things, but rather we'll do our best to respond to the needs of our environment. Um, if someone asks us a question, then with this mindset of um, sharing what we have, then even if we, we feel like we, the insight or the, the, the view that we have is not complete, we'll do our best to be present for that person and to share. Um, even if, um, like the local town of Bilpin asked us to lead a, a meditation class for them, <laughs> both Brother Tenzin and I said to ourselves, um, goodness, like we, we are um, operating a, a practice center here. We're trying to found a practice center. We, um, we really have days that begin sometimes at 4.30 in the morning and finish about 11 or something at night. How can we add one more thing? And then we thought, you know what, if, if somebody's asking us, you know, then we will, this is one of our principles, then we'll do our best to respond. And this is something I think that for all of us as practitioners, I really feel it's an invitation into spiritual adulthood. If somebody asks us a question and we're there, then we're the right person. Um, we often have a, a tendency to think like we're not ready or whether it's um, to take the 14 mindfulness trainings or we're not ready to facilitate a Dharma discussion or we're not ready whatever it might be. But um, the truth is, we're never quite ready. We're never, I can tell you right now, even after so many years, um, I'm never quite ready to give a Dharma talk. In fact, I'd be a bit worried if I was feeling completely ready um, because there's always an element of just showing up um, and doing our best um, to, to be an instrument. And so this third practice of, that we've kind of discovered <laughs> by being here on the land and, and uh, being wholehearted and being simple, I feel it's a very deep principle and it's an important one for us at this time that this is really what we're invited to into as practitioners to step forward and to have some confidence um, in our capacity to be able to both um, go deeply in our own practice and to be able to be of benefit to others. So often we don't even realize that something as simple as a look or a smile um, a word can transform a person's life. 
Um, so this is uh, the, the inner aspect of the third principle. Let me invite a sound of the bell. Oh, I have so much to share about right intention this evening. Um, I don't know if we'll get to all of it. We'll see what comes forward. I've been so looking forward to sharing uh, with everybody the theme for this week. Um, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is called in Pali Sama Sankapa, which we tend to translate as right intention. It's sometimes you'll see that it's translated, Sama Sankapa is translated as right thought. And it's seen to be a continuation of the previous factor of the path, which was right view or complete view, or upright view. And you'll remember from our talk of last week that these first two factors are, while they're the beginning of the, the path, they're also uh, considered to be the culmination of the path. They're considered to be the wisdom or the prajna section of the, the path, the path that both, uh, the part of the path that both generates insight and also manifests insight. So in a way, it's, uh, if we have a penetrating view of the nature of our life, the nature of existence, um, emerging from our um, reflection, from our deep looking. Um, and if we've investigated that, then that brings forth a reorientation of our values, which moves us in a direction towards liberation, towards freedom. It changes our direction fundamentally. Um, this redirection, this reorientation um, of our mind and also our mindfulness in the sense of our applied attention is um, what's meant by right intention, this reorientation. In the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses 141 in a, a text called the analysis of the truths, um, the Buddha shares with us very clearly and very succinctly what is meant by right intention as a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. The Buddha says, and what, friends, is right intention? Thoughts of letting go, renunciation, of goodwill and harmlessness. This is right intention. So I don't think we can get more succinct than that. The Buddha's Dharma talk on right intention was much more succinct than mine will be. Um, and so in that short, pithy insight, the Buddha shares with, with us the three aspects of right intention, which we'll explore together this evening. Um, renunciation, letting go, goodwill, and harmlessness. They're the three aspects of right intention. So each kind of right intention helps to transform a corresponding kind of not yet complete or wrong intention. The intention of renunciation or letting go is an antidote for the intention of desire, this mind or this consciousness that we always need one more thing um, in order to finally be okay or to finally be ready, whatever it might be. The Buddha taught us that maybe do, do with a little bit less and you'll discover something wonderful. The intention of goodwill is an antidote for the intention of ill will. And the intention of harmlessness is an antidote for the intention of harmfulness. When the Buddha was practicing uh, to liberate himself, when he was meditating in the forest, the Buddha found that his thoughts, the nature of his thoughts, could be divided into two different classes. In one class, he, he put thoughts that were arising out of a mind of desire, um, this mind of lack or of ill will or harmfulness. That was kind of the first category. 
Um, and when he noticed uh, thoughts of um, the, the other kind, thoughts of renunciation, goodwill, and harmlessness, he put them in kind of another category. Uh, whenever he noticed thoughts of the first kind arising in him, he realized that these kind of thoughts were not usually beneficial for himself um, and not beneficial for others, that they actually were not manifesting insight or wisdom and were leading away from liberation, away from freedom. And so reflecting in this way, seeing this, he decided to stop providing nutriment to those kinds of thoughts when they arose. Um, but whenever thoughts of the second kind arose, thoughts of kindness, of harmlessness, of um, letting go, then he, and he, he saw the fruit of those in his own life, he understood them to be beneficial, supportive to the growth of wisdom and liberation in himself. And so he strengthened those thoughts and began to consciously water them. So right intention as a path factor is the second factor of the path. It's right in between right view and the three ethical or sila factors of the path that begins with right speech. Because our mind's intentional function forms the crucial link connecting our mental and cognitive perspective, our inner perspective with our active modes of engagement with the world. So this is like the linking point here, um, intentionality. Our actions will usually point back to the thoughts from which they spring, right? Thought or intention is usually the forerunner of action. It directs our body and speech, um, which in some ways are, as we just mentioned, are the outward instruments that reflect the aims and ideals, subtle and hidden or overt, of our mind. Our intentions also point back to the pre prevailing views that we hold, um, our worldviews that have given rise to particular kinds of action. When we have an incomplete view, the outcome is a, a, a not yet complete or a wrong intention, which will give rise to unhelpful actions. When our intentions are in line with our deepest aspiration, our actions will reflect that. Um, and if our intentions match our deepest aspiration, then they're a confirmation of right view. Um, if we notice the fruit manifesting in ourselves, fruits of liberation, fruits of peace, fruits of happiness, then you don't need anybody else to tell you that you're on the right path. When we recite that line in our Plum Village text, happiness is knowing that we're on the right path. This is not knowing this because somebody else told us or that we read it in a book but welling forth from our own experience. With the three um, aspects of right intention, the Buddha shared that for any intention to be right, it should spring from those three wholesome or beneficial roots. But as we mentioned last week, the profoundest aspect of right view is understanding the Four Noble Truths and seeing the Four Noble Truths in each and every moment of our lives, seeing their operation in each and every moment of our lives. <clears throat> Understanding the Four Noble Truths internally in relation to our own life gives rise to the intention of letting go. If we really see the operation of these truths, just even for a split second, we have this aha moment, then this energy of, of realizing how we've been clinging on to so many things all of our lives, um, it becomes clear to us and it becomes natural to practice letting go, um, letting go of, um, of thinking that our true security comes from holding on to objects, whether it's food or whether it's uh, belong, other kinds of belongings or whether it's people or ideas. We can be quite good at holding on to ideas. Uh, understanding the Four Noble Truths in relation to others um, gives rise to the other two aspects of right intention, which we'll also consider together. So understanding the, the Four Noble Truths, seeing the, the operation of the Four Noble Truths 
in our own life gives rise to the first aspect of right intention of um of uh being willing to let go of not hold on anymore and then when we um uh, consider the four noble truths in relationship to others then this sense of goodwill the sense of unconditional friendliness of loving kindness manifests and the wish to not harm self and others manifests so those that's how it um how it kind of manifests it all hinges around seeing the operation of the four noble truths at some level within ourselves and in operation in the lives of others and in the world around when we see how our own lives um, are pervaded by the sense of dukkha of unsatisfactoriness of never quite getting there i um, mean how this dukkha um, I'm sorry, I just have to have an aside here. Um, in Australia, we, uh, the word that we use for suffering or unsatisfactoriness in Buddhism is dukkha. In Australia, we have a, a kind of a dip that uh, you dip your bread in, you put in olive oil and you dip your bread in, and it's also called dukkha. Sometimes Australian people call it dukkha, but here we don't want to dip um, ourselves into dukkha too much. Um, we're talking about it just in, for all the Aussies that are, are listening. We're talking about a different kind of dukkha here. We're talking not about the the dip that we put, we mix with olive oil, but we're talking about the unsatisfactoriness um, of our life. The the first noble truth that in the human realm, in the in samsara as a whole, um, that there'll always be this sense at some level of never quite being complete of unsatisfactoriness um, this this sense of lack and how this very dukkha this unsatisfactoriness this suffering um, actually comes out of this idea of lack of thirst of craving um, and at some point sooner or later but hopefully sooner um, our mind will kind of just feel like it's old and played out um, we've been down this road many times. We've walked that track, track in the carpet one too many times. It's over. It might have served its purpose, um, but it's done. People sometimes say to us, oh, it must be so difficult for you to give up this, to give up that, to give up something else. And you know what? It wasn't really. Um, it just it had served its purpose and it no longer serves anymore um, for, for us. So it's actually a joy. And this is the, the mind that's inclined towards letting go. The word renunciation can sound very heavy. Um, I like disenchantment or letting go. Um, because when you think about enchantment, it's kind of like this sense of being bewitched by something, being caught, by some, caught up in something. Um, but then we have this moment in which um, that enchantment falls away. We wake up the scales from fall from our eyes and we see it for what it is. And um, we might have celebrated having had that experience, but it's done. It's okay. And it's time to, to move on. So this, this uh, inclining towards letting go of understanding that our true security comes from um, letting go of leaving behind the, the old patterns that no longer serve. There's that story that, Hey, our teacher often tells about the farmhand who came uh, running uh, through the forest and he came into contact with the Buddha and a group of monks and the Buddha said, what's happened to you, friend? And the farmer said, oh, I'm looking for my cows. Have you seen my cows? I've lost my cows. And the Buddha said, oh, I'm sorry, friend. We haven't seen your cows come this way. And then after the, the farmer left, the Buddha said to the monks, aren't you lucky that you have no cows? Um, cows here can be physical objects, but they can also be ideas or patterns of behavior. Sometimes when we think about cows or we hear that story, we just stop at the physical things, cars or houses or whatever it might be. But it can also be ideas or modes of behavior, patterns of thinking. When we apply the lens of the Four Noble Truths as a way of looking at others and all of these uh, practices are lenses through which we view our own experience and the world around us then this lens naturally nurtures loving kindness or goodwill and harmlessness we see that like ourselves 
um, everybody else is in the same situation, even if it manifests in a unique way. Um, and that at some level, even if it's really hidden down there deep, at some level, everybody wants to be happy, even if they don't know how. Um, and this nurtures a sense of loving kindness, a sense of friendliness, kind of a, 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 an aching, a softness of the heart, um, especially when we realize that like ourselves, they also suffer. Um, and when we realize that we just couldn't feel like we would want to harm them, this sense of tenderness comes out, um, this sense of harmlessness. So from the time we begin cultivating the Noble Eightfold Path, then, and I, I want to say that again, from the time we begin cultivating the Noble Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path is not a set of ideas for us to read about or to um, think about or try to grasp, but actually qualities to cultivate in our lives. From the time we begin to cultivate these eight factors, the first two factors of right view and right intention come together and begin to work on the three unwholesome roots in our consciousness, greed, ill will, or um, hatred or aversion, sometimes we, we call it, and the third root of delusion. Sometimes delusion is translated as ignorance, but I like delusion more. Well, it's not that I like delusion, but I like the translation of delusion a little bit more because ignorance can mean just not knowing um, but delusion means seeing something but in a mistaken way a little bit like the example of enchantment before and so if we look a little closer at the three roots we see that they can be broadly classed into two areas either primarily cognitive or primarily emotive even though, of course, they inter R and they contain elements of each. So delusion, which is not seeing things for what they are. It's one of the main issues we have, let's face it. It's one of the most tricky routes to transform. And it's gradually transformed by actively cultivating right view. Um, the first factor of the path, which is wisdom and understanding in its seed form. Right view is wisdom and understanding in its seed form. Delusion is considered to be primarily a cognitive root, um, a root in our consciousness, although it also expresses itself, of course, emotively. Now, completely transforming delusion will only take place when right view is fully developed but every single flickering of right view or right understanding contributes to this transformation. It's just like the example of um, this morning in the class, we were, uh, for our friends here in Bilpin, we were learning um, an introductory aspect of loving kindness meditation because it's one of my favorites. So uh, we we're offering some loving kindness meditation and I described the practice of loving kindness meditation is being like a tiny little ripple in the river of our mind. And that tiny little ripple over time becomes a current and then uh, a, it becomes a little stronger, a little wider and slowly that, that current will take that little rip that will take over the whole stream and it will become the whole stream of the, the river. So every little flickering of right view will slowly um, take over the river of, uh, that we call delusion, the root of delusion in our consciousness. The other two roots, hatred and greed, which um, present themselves more in the area of emotion or more emotively, are transformed through the redirecting of and the cultivation of the path factor of intention in its three aspects. The intention of letting go, of uh, renunciation or disenchantment, the intention of goodwill, and the intention of harmlessness. Let's have a sound of the bell to enjoy our breathing.
How are you doing? Has anybody fallen asleep yet? Okay, good. Not yet. The three roots are very deep um, in our consciousness, the three unwholesome roots. And transforming them takes time, takes a lifetime, or perhaps even lifetimes after lifetimes if we subscribe to the view of rebirth. The path or the Noble Eightfold Path, which I consider to be brilliant, um, that the Buddha devised, um, it makes use of an indirect approach to transforming these three roots. Rather than um, trying to dig out these roots really deeply, um, immediately uh, we take this indirect approach by, by working with the thoughts and framework of, frameworks of mind that arise from these roots. Since they exist in a self-perpetuating and self-reinforcing feedback loop. So since greed and ill will or aversion surface in the form of thoughts, we practice gently to replace them with their opposite qualities. Take cause this change in the peg, um, which nowadays um, people don't uh, really relate to that so much anymore. So we might consider it like changing the track. Um, if you're on Spotify or something like that, changing to the next song, um, if it's not working for you, for you anymore. So the intention of letting go um, provides uh, a counterbalance, an antidote to greed. Um, so greed comes to manifestation in thoughts of, of uh, desire or possession or the, the need, the thought that we need to acquire something. And thoughts of uh, letting go um, spring from the wholesome root of non-greed, of generosity, which they actually activate and strengthen whenever they're cultivated. Since, believe it or not, according to Buddhist psychology, contrary thoughts cannot coexist at the same moment in time, the same split second. When thoughts of letting go are cultivated, when we actively nurture and water these uh, thoughts or these seeds, they disrupt thoughts or patterns of uh, acquiring things of greed or lack. And then they actually cause non-greed or as I like to translate it, simplicity and uh, generosity and enjoying the conditions we have to replace our tendency of always running after something. So in a similar way, the intention of loving kindness, of goodwill and harmlessness, they offer an antidote to aversion, this closing down of the heart, this um, uh, turning away. Sometimes we translate it as hatred, but that's a very extreme manifestation of aversion, which is basically just any kind of shutting down. Um, aversion comes to manifestation either in thoughts of ill will as angry, hostile, or resentful thoughts, um, or in thoughts of harming as the impulses to cruelty, aggression, and destruction. Um, thoughts of goodwill counter the inflow and outflow of aversion. Now, often when we think of aversion, we're thinking of aversive behavior outwards. But for many of us in the West and in modern society, one of the major focuses of our aversion is inward towards ourself. So we thoughts of goodwill counter this inflow and outflow of aversion, thoughts of harmlessness, the um, focus on uh, focus particularly on the, the outflow. And in, in this way, they cut off the nutriment to the root of aversion itself. So with the intention of renunciation, the, the Buddha described his teaching as running contrary to the way of the world, the usual way of things. Now the world here in this sentence symbolizes all of our habitual ways of doing things. So he's not only talking about society or whatever, but our habitual ways of doing things. I always find it fascinating. Um, and I'm a person perhaps that's easily fascinated. I will, I will own up to that. But um, 
I find it incredibly interesting and fascinating that whenever people come to the monastery or come to a retreat and are sharing about their visit here at the end of their stay or the, the, um, at the monastery or at the end of a retreat, there'll be one or two people who will say something like, well, now it's time to go back to the real world. And I find that interesting because who decided that the ordinary way that society demands that we live our lives is the real world? and that the cultivation of presence and heart is the unreal world. It's a choice. Um, in many ways, honestly, we've sold ourselves down the river. Um, we've sold ourselves to a certain way of thinking, a certain way of being, um, thinking that there's no other choice. Now, the usual way of the world, whether it is society or whether we see our usual way of doing things as symbolizing the world here, um, it's the way of this concept of lack and desire associated with lack. The idea that we'll gain happiness or peace or whatever um, we're looking for by pursuing outward or inward objects that we think that we lack. The Buddha's message of letting go of renunciation states exactly the opposite, um, exactly the opposite to what the world um, what society, um, what the usual way of doing things tells us or expects of us. It's totally countercultural. Um, the Buddha says happiness and fulfillment come from letting go. We haven't seen many advertising campaigns that tell us that at all, have they? Happiness and fulfillment will come from letting go. You don't need any more things. I think I might have mentioned a couple of weeks ago that our friends here in the town um, said to us, it's so lovely to have the monastics here, to have the brothers here. Um, every Saturday we have a market, um, which we actually knew because we, we are coming to the, the market just to chat with the people and um, they have a breakfast for the local people in the town here. And so we go and uh, we, we be together with the local community just to hear what's happening and to share um, some things. And they said, uh, you really need to have a stall at the market. And I said, we don't have anything to sell. Um, we have nothing to sell. Why, you know, we're not interested also in, in making money. And they said, you don't need to sell anything. Just come there and be yourself. And <laughs> so we decided that we would have a stall um, that would have a, a calligraphy on it that says, you have enough um, in amongst the other stalls that are selling all the different jams or little cakes that they make and things. The monastery will have a stall that says you have enough. So every, the last couple of weeks, we've had a stall there that um, has some calligraphies from Tay and some books for people to borrow. And if people want to take a calligraphy home, they can offer a donation or not. Um, or if they'd like to take a book home, we say you can borrow it or you can keep it. If you feel like you'd like it, it's yours. You know, this kind of thing. So <laughs> we, are, uh, we are doing something quite countercultural. You have enough. And it was interesting the first week, um, people love to hang out with us, but they found it quite um, disconcerting. Like they would, uh, everybody else was trying to sell their things, even though up here it's very simple. So often they'll have, a couple of old cracked teacups or a teapot or something like that to, to sell. It's very, it's really lovely. But um, for us, we're not trying to sell anything. We just, um, uh, we would have a sign saying, you know, just pay it forward, take what you need, um, these kind of uh, energies. And so people, especially the people that have come up from Sydney would look at our store and kind of look at us and have a quizzical expression on their face. But the local people have, uh, have loved it. And um, the person who organized the market tries to give us one of the prime positions like <laughs> in the market, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. So it can seem kind of crazy. It's so counterintuitive that it can seem crazy um, that to, to think that we already have enough. Uh, we don't need the new model. Um, we don't need anything, but we already have enough. If we want to transform this framework of lack, this framework of always thinking that we need one more thing, um, outward or inward, then one of the most powerful practices is that practice offered by Tay or um, offered by uh, the Mountain Spring Stall at the local market, you have enough. Or as I like to say, you are enough. 
um, desire itself, I want to note, I want to mention, is not in itself morally bad. Um, don't make your practice, your spiritual practice, into a war. It can be interesting to reflect about the fact that the desire for liberation, the desire for peace, the desire for harmony, and so on, is also a form of desire. But it's considered to be a wholesome form of desire or a helpful form of desire. So when we use the word desire, again, just like that catch-all word suffering, I think we need to be very specific um, and to look into what we're actually searching for and to always understand that if a desire springs from this idea that we lack something, then it's considered to be not yet helpful. Um, if we are searching for liberation or happiness that we think is outside of ourselves, then that search will go on forever. Um, but if we approach that journey of discovery by understanding that it's always already there for us, then that journey is a journey that may not uh, take that long after all. So let's not make our spiritual practice, our spiritual path into a war. There's more than enough of those. Um, in fact, desire is a fundamental human drive. Um, let's redirect this energy of desire from its unskillful state, where we're always focusing on what we don't have into what we already have and build up a sense and an understanding of our own capacity. The false view that not yet skillful desire manifests from this idea of lack and that we need more stuff, physical things or ideas to give us security is the issue here. There's a new phrase that people are using lately. It's called stuffication, being suffocated by stuff. Um, they refer to it in terms of having too much stuff around and there are consultants that come to help um, people uh, to minimize the amount of stuff that they have. They wouldn't have a very big job if they come to the monastery, honestly. Um, my family, my cousin came to visit and he, he's, uh, uh, he looked around and he said, this is really quite bare, isn't it? I said, yeah, but we already feel like we have too much. Like, we, want to get rid of uh, uh, some things. So for us also on a deeper level, stuffication can refer to all of the ideas and concepts that we, we have, all of the things that the ideas and, and concepts that we hide behind. We can also be suffocated by those. So don't get the wrong idea though. The Buddha didn't demand that everybody leave the household life for the monastery. Um, but what the Buddha did invite each one of us to do is to do the work of looking at our false securities and comforts and to look for the real comfort. Ah, attachment is so subtle. Um, often in the initial stages when a behavior or an idea or a possession is no longer serving and we practice to let go, um, we feel like it's time to let go, we might encounter a powerful inner resistance and it's in that moment that things get interesting in fact it's often interesting we usually tend towards extremes in those moments out of fear so the buddha didn't offer as a solution to that dilemma the method of repression he didn't offer that the repression is the attempt to drive desire away from us with a mind of fear and loathing and aversion. This approach doesn't solve the problem at all, but it only pushes it below the surface where it can continue to thrive. The tool that the Buddha holds out to transform desire is to cultivate renunciation or disenchantment, as I've used before. Um, and the tool is right understanding. Um, real renunciation is not a matter of compelling ourselves or forcing ourselves in any way, as I shared earlier. But rather, we see the true nature of something, or we see the true nature of ourselves. Um, and when it has served its purpose, we change our perspective on it, so that we no longer define ourselves or our happiness by that object, that person, or that idea. 
When we truly understand the nature of desire, this mind of lack, when we investigate it closely with keen attention, desire falls away by itself. We don't have too much need of any struggle. Desire is always bound up with the sense of dukkha, of unsatisfactoriness. So the whole phenomenon of desire with its cycle of wanting and gratification, it hangs on our way of seeing things. We are caught in desire and in this cycle because we see it as our only way to get happiness. We feel like it's our only way. Changing our perspective, as I've mentioned a couple of times as being important here, is a result of cultivating what we call appropriate attention. Um, Yoni so maniskara. And our teacher Tay has spoken a lot, many times on this. So just as perception influences thought, as we spoke earlier, so thought can influence perception in a feedback loop. It's another feedback loop, like the one we mentioned earlier. So just between you and me, let's be honest, our usual perceptions are tinged or perhaps daubed, painted heavily <laughs> with unwise attention, not wise attention. They're tinged with ayoniso maniskara, unwise attention. We normally look only at surface things, scanning them in terms of our immediate interests and wants, and only occasionally do we explore the roots or the long range consequences of something. So this exploration, this journey of discovery calls for appropriate attention, or sometimes we call it wise consideration, looking into the hidden undertones of our actions, exploring their results, actually like exploring their results in our life, not just thinking about what they might be, but exploring what happens when we go down that path and evaluating, looking back and reflecting on whether those results um, and the kind of goals that motivated those actions that gave rise to those results are in line with our aspirations. In this deep looking, in this investigation, we don't focus on just on what's pleasant or unpleasant, but on what's true and what's real. Because sometimes what's actually most helpful may not be necessarily the most pleasant thing quote unquote, in that moment. We're ready and willing to discover what's true, even at the cost of our small comforts. Um, just like the interaction between Neo and Morpheus in The Matrix, I think many of us have seen the movie The Matrix, when Neo is offered the choice between the red and the blue pills. The blue pill, the pill that lulls us back into a comfortable everyday illusion um, that's our habitual choice. That's the pill that we normally take um, in every moment. If we, if we understand uh, this uh, scenario and we look a little bit deeply, this pill is being, this choice of the two pills are being offered to us in each and every moment. And most of the time, about 99% of the time in the beginning, we take the blue pill to just get lulled back into our sense of um, complacency. Cultivating yoni so maniskara or wise consideration means to be willing to take the red pill um, into a broader way of looking at things, at our ideas, our perceptions, our habitual reactions, even at the expense of the small comforts of our complacency. This is the big illusion, the maha maya that we're caught in, friends. We constantly take the blue pill because taking the red pill Trying something different is scary. It's really scary on a visceral level because as much as we wish to liberate ourselves from the shore of suffering, as much as we want that, and we'll tell each other that we want that, as much as we want to liberate ourselves from this shore, the shore of suffering that we've created for ourselves individually and collectively, and that we're standing on, we have yet to realize that we actually identify with it, and we define ourselves by it. Bottom line, to cultivate appropriate attention, to cultivate this path, means to be willing to step off that shore, in some ways to step off the cliff, 
because counterintuitively, our real security lies on the other side, the other shore, um, not on the shore of comfort. And comfort here is comfort with a small c. Let's have the sound of the bell. There are so many cycles of samsara in our life. Um, and one of this is the cycle, the feedback loop of desire. Um, if we look closely at it, we often find that it co-arises with this sense of dissatisfaction, the sense of dukkha. Sometimes dukkha appears as pain or irritation. Often it lies low as a constant strain of discontent. But the two, desire and dukkha, are inseparable. Um, the Buddha always suggested to each of us that we confirm everything for ourselves. So let's consider the whole cycle of desire. At the moment, desire springs up. This again is um, not yet skillful desire. Springs up, there's a sense of lack, this dull ache of want. Hot, cold, sugar, love, coffee, whatever it might be. To end this pain, we desperately work to fulfill that desire. Big desires, small desires, whatever it might be. If our effort fails, what happens? We experience frustration, disappointment, and sometimes despair. But even when we succeed, it doesn't last that long. Um, we worry that we might lose the ground that we've gained. Um, we feel driven to get more or to hold on to what we have and to establish even tighter controls, even though intellectually we know that um, things are impermanent and holding on is not going to, to do anything much, but we hold on. The reality is that the thing that we're holding on to, that we're defining ourselves by, is constantly in a state of change. It's impermanent. And believe it or not, so are we. We want things, we want feelings, we want people, we want ideas to last forever. But this is impossible, no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we grip onto them. The pain of this realization when it hits, and at some point, if we're lucky, it will hit. It's deep. It cuts deep because it's everything that we've defined ourselves by up until now. But that pain is necessary. Contemplating the dukkha, the unsatisfactoriness of our usual desires is one way to nurture letting go, disenchantment or renunciation. Another way is to reflect on the benefits flowing from renunciation or disenchantment or letting go. As Tay reminds us, happiness comes from letting go. To redirect our attention from acquiring things to being satisfied with what we have, of realizing that we have enough, we are enough. Um, it le it's, it's so counterintuitive because we usually think that renunciation will bring us pain or will bring us suffering or grief, but the opposite is true. Desire will ultimately bring about those things. Um, in fact, if we look deeply, the whole of the Buddhist spiritual path can be seen as a process of letting go with liberation or nirvana, as it's called in Sanskrit, being the final stage of letting go. In fact, in um, the original texts, it's called the relinquishing of all the foundations of existence. So contemplate that for a moment. All of the foundations of existence, relinquishing, letting go of all the foundations of existence. When we methodically contemplate the dangers of desire and the benefits of letting go, living with an open hand and an open heart, Gradually, our mind turns away from the domination of lack and desire. Things that we used to define ourselves by fall away 
I guess in a poetic way, you could say like the leaves of a tree fall in the autumn, naturally and spontaneously. These changes don't necessarily come suddenly, but gradually and beautifully. The second aspect of right intention, if you thought we were done already with right intention, surprise, we've just looked at the first aspect of the three aspects. It's a very profound, um, a profound aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path. And I feel one of the key aspects for us to cultivate. So the second aspect of right intention is the intention of goodwill. Cultivating an intention of goodwill helps us to transform our tendency towards aversion or ill will within ourselves, to closing down deep within, to thoughts and actions from the root of anger and aversion. Just like in the case of greed and desire, there are two ineffective ways to handle ill will. One is to yield to it, to express the aversion by bodily or verbal action. This approach will temporarily release the tension. It'll help to drive the anger out of one system. Um, but it also tends to actually nurture the resentment, retaliation, um, can create enemies, um, poison relationships. And in the end, the ill will doesn't really leave our system at all, but instead is driven down to a deeper level where it continues to feed our thoughts and our conduct. In some way, by not paying appropriate attention to it, we actually make it stronger. Which is really the opposite than the way we normally think, isn't it? One of the ways to um, deal with this tendency of uh, ill will is to cultivate a sense of uh, loving kindness, of unconditional friendliness. And this is important even in the initial stages. So the first approach is the approach of um, focusing on uh, this, this tendency of expressing. And that's, we could kind of, if we don't have a skillful view, we could look at that as kind of an aspect of loving kindness, but we don't see it that way in, in uh, Buddhist psychology. The other approach, repression, also tends to end up falling and failing. Um, by merely turning that force around and by pushing it inwards, where ill will can sometimes become self-contempt or chronic depression or even a tendency to irrational outbursts of violence. The Buddha recommends to transform ill will when the object is ourselves or another person. The Buddha recommends a cultivating a quality called metta. This word metta derives from another word, mitra, which means friend. Um, but metta or loving kindness is much more than just being friendly. Um, it's a deeply felt sense of selfless love and care for ourselves and for other beings, radiating outwards as a heartfelt concern for their well being and happiness. It's a powerful force and a protector, as those who are participating in the sutra class, which at this moment in time, we're focusing on the loving kindness discourse um, can tell you. Metta or loving kindness is not just a sentimental goodwill, but a deep inner feeling, a spontaneous warmth rather than a sense of obligation. Loving kindness is considered to be a divine abiding, a Brahma Vihara, a total way of being centered on the radiant wish for the welfare of all living beings, including selves. The love involved in loving kindness doesn't hinge on having particular relationships to particular people. Um, we're concerned only with infusing ourselves and suffusing others with a mind and a heart of loving kindness. We actually cultivate this quality as an exercise in meditation. And it's a very beautiful meditation. Uh, an absolutely delightful meditation. 
Now, there are some who have said that the idea of deliberately developing love, deliberately developing love, um, it's been criticized as being a bit contrived or mechanical. Love, uh, some people say, can only be genuine when it's spontaneous and it arises without an inner prompting or effort. But in Buddhism, we also, we feel that love, this powerful force of unconditional friendliness is also something that we need to, it's a quality that we need to cultivate, something that we need to train in, just like the example of the ripple before and the example that I gave in the class this morning of it takes time and effort for that ripple to overtake the whole current and to become the current of the river. And it's in the same way, it's the same with the cultivating of this quality, um, this warm-hearted quality of loving kindness. At first, to create that ripple, some effort needs to be made. And over time, the feeling of love becomes ingrained and grafted in our mind as a natural and spontaneous tendency. It becomes our natural uh, response. So the method of developing this goodwill, this unconditional friendliness is through the meditation on loving kindness. It's one of the most important kinds of Buddhist meditation. Um, in fact, I remember my first meditation teacher sharing with me that um, it was so important whenever we practice meditation to begin with just a even a few minutes of loving kindness meditation, especially if you find um, and I did when I first began to meditate, I found that it was difficult for me to concentrate. If we find that our mind does not go easily into concentration, to spend a few minutes cultivating loving kindness and to radiate loving kindness to our meditation object. Um, that might be the breath or it might be um, another uh, object, but to spend um, a few moments uh, radiating loving kindness to our meditation object and then our mind goes very naturally into uh, concentration. And I found that to be the case um, for myself. So loving kindness meditation itself as a meditation subject begins with radiating loving kindness towards ourself. And it's suggested that we take ourselves as the first object of loving kindness because true loving kindness for others is only possible when we feel a genuine loving kindness for ourselves. It might be that a significant amount of the anger and hostility that we direct towards others actually springs from a hostility that we might have towards ourselves. And when this loving kindness is directed inwards towards ourselves, it helps to melt down the hard shell of these negative attitudes. Um, and it allows this sense of friendliness um, and kindness to go inwards and flow outwards. And once we generate that towards ourselves, we're able to extend it out to others. And this expansion brings about with it an insight um, of seeing our identity, um, our sense of identity and oneness um, with others. If we look into our own mind, as we share earlier, we see that our own basic urge is to be happy and to be free of suffering. Um, and if, as soon as we see that in others, it's one of the first steps in breaking down this, these layers of self-identification. We come to understand that everybody shares the same wish. So we start with our own wish for happiness and then, um, from that foundation, we experience this urge as the basic urge of everybody else. And we wish that they all experience ease and happiness in body and mind. This uh, continues on uh, as we go, we begin with people who are dear to us, then people who are neutral, people who are distant, and then to hostile people until we're able to have this spontaneous outpouring of loving kindness to all. And then we suffuse the whole world with loving kindness above, below, and all the way through. The intention of harmlessness is the third aspect of uh, right intention. And it, in order to describe uh, harmlessness, 
um, it's important to recall that we just spoke about loving kindness. The intention of harmlessness is compassionate thought. If um, the intention of goodwill is the, the thought of loving kindness, the intention of harmlessness is the development of compassion, of karuna. Compassion is like a complement to loving kindness, whereas metta, loving kindness, has as its nature the wish of joy and happiness and welfare for others and ourselves. Compassion has the characteristic of wishing that ourself and others be free from all harm and suffering, a wish that's extended without limit to all living beings. It's one of the most precious qualities that we can contemplate, and it's the, the second divine abiding, the second Brahma Vihara. Cultivating these qualities can be subtle. The near enemy of compassion, Karuna, something that can easily be mistaken for is pity. The far enemy, its exact opposite, is cruelty. In Mahayana, Great Vehicle Buddhism, compassion is one of the two most prized qualities, compassion and wisdom. And compassion is seen to be a wish-fulfilling jewel um, and the hallmark of a great being or a bodhisattva. In one of the most beautiful texts on compassion and bodhicitta, the mind of love, the way of the bodhisattva by Shantideva, Shantideva says the following, at first, Meditate on the sameness of yourselves and others. In joy and in sorrow, all of us are equal. Thus be a guardian of all as you're a guardian of yourself. The hand and other limbs are many and distinct, but all are one, the body to be kept and guarded. Likewise, Different beings in their joys and sorrows are, like me, all one in wanting happiness. This pain of mine does not afflict or cause discomfort to another's body. And yet this pain is hard for me to bear because I cling to it and I take it for my own. And others pain I do not feel. And yet because I take them for myself, their suffering is mine and therefore hard to bear. And therefore, I'll practice to transform the pain of others. For it is simply pain, just like my own. And others I will help and benefit, for they are living beings like my own body. Since I and other beings both, in wanting happiness, are equal and the same. What difference is there to distinguish us? that I should strive to have my ultimate happiness alone. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful text from the way of the Bodhisattva, which I love. Um, like loving kindness, compassion arises by entering into the subjectivity of others, by sharing their pain and experiencing it in a deep and total way, as if, never forget the as if, as if it was our own. Compassion springs up by considering that all beings like ourselves want to be free from suffering and yet despite their best efforts, continue to have pain, fear, sorrow and other forms of dukkha. So to develop compassion as a loving, as a meditative exercise, it's best to start with somebody who's actually undergoing suffering. This might be ourselves. Since that provides a natural object for developing compassion. We contemplate this person's suffering either directly or imaginatively, and we reflect that just like ourselves, that person wants to be free of suffering, just like me. This thought should be repeated until this natural feeling of compassion, of a quivering of the heart, um, swells up. Actually, in the, the commentaries, karuna is defined as having that quality of a quivering of the heart. Then using that feeling as a standard, just like in loving kindness, we turn to the different categories of living beings, considering how each experiences suffering, just like me. <clears throat> and we radiate that gentle feeling of compassion um, toward them. And so 
And then we deepen that contemplation by considering the different kinds of suffering to which we're all susceptible. And a useful framework to do this contemplation is provided by the first noble truth with all of its different aspects of dukkha, of unsatisfactoriness. So we contemplate, for example, uh, living beings as being subject to getting older, as, to old age, and then as being subject to sickness, then to death, then to sorrow, to pain, to grief and despair, and so on. When this contemplation ripens, um, then we move on to consider people who are currently enjoying happiness, which they might have acquired um, by immoral means. We might reflect that such people, despite their superficial fortune or fame or whatever it might be, or power, they're probably troubled um, deep within by pangs of conscience. And even if they display no outward signs of distress, we know that eventually they'll reap what they sow, um, which will bring them a lot of pain. Um, and when we, we see that, it's a deeply heart-opening experience. Once, um, not so long ago, <coughs> excuse me, not so long ago, uh, uh, we were asked what the what we, uh, what were, uh, a spiritual teacher was uh, was thinking of a, a current political leader, a very well known political leader, and um, that spiritual teacher said, um, "I know, uh, I feel sorry for that person because I see their suffering. You know, I see the pain that person's causing pain everywhere. How can they not be um, experiencing pain as well?" And that's the exact insight of of compassion. Um, the person might at this moment in time have a lot of power and influence or money, um, but sooner or later, they're going to be subject to, to pain, um, to a deep suffering. And when we see that, we can have compassion. We generate compassion for that person. So in our meditation, we can also reflect on everybody, including ourselves, as subject to the universal cycles of samsara, um, which are created by ourselves through our uh, greed, these roots of greed or lack um, and aversion or ill will and delusion. So remember that these are meditative contemplations and not just things to theoretically think about. So the three aspects of generating right intention, of uh, cultivating thoughts of renunciation, of letting go, goodwill and harmlessness help to transform our usual habitual patterns of not yet skillful desire, ill will and harmfulness. I really want to ask you, dear friends, uh, from the bottom of my heart, please put some of these things into practice, even one of these things. Um, these contemplations have been taught as methods of practice. Buddhism is always very practical and they're not theoretical ideas. Um, to nurture the intention of renunciation, we can contemplate the suffering tied up with the quest for worldly enjoyment. To develop the intention of goodwill, we contemplate how everybody desires happiness and to develop and nurture the intention of harmlessness, the third aspect of right intention. We have to consider how all beings wish to be free of suffering and that everybody reaps, in a sense, what they sow individually and collectively. And that deep quivering, that deep welling up of the heart um, comes forth. So the Buddha has told us over and over and over again that whatever we frequently reflect on, it becomes our inclination. It becomes the inclination of our mind. So if we nurture the capacity to frequently, frequently contemplate renunciation, goodwill, and harmlessness, they will become the inclination of our mind. So dear beloved community, um, I hope that you found something helpful, that you found something useful this evening. Um, it's been uh, an absolute delight to have a chance to be together with all of you. And I hope you found something beneficial. 
I hope that each of you has a wonderful week and I'm looking forward to your reflections on intentionality in the Compassionate Ocean Sangha, either in our evening sessions or in the Facebook group um, through this week. So I wish everybody well and we'll come to a close with the sound of the bell. So dear friends, I'm not uh, unaware of the fact that it took me an hour and 23 minutes to explain what the Buddha said in one sentence. Um, so, so that's quite humbling. <laughs> dear friends, have a wonderful, have a wonderful week and uh, see you next time.